Welcome all in Australia and around the world for this timely webinar on an issue more prevalent than perhaps ever before and right at the forefront of contemporary discourse in the global sport, athletes' rights. We respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians, the Bedigal people of the land where we're broadcasting from, the Kensington campus of UNSW, and my name is Craig Foster. We're here to celebrate the imminent release of the new Human Rights Defender magazine by the Australian Human Rights Institute of uh, University of New South Wales. And the first edition comprises writing on a diverse array of issues sport is wrestling with, very often through strong and principled advocacy of athletes themselves. Kalita Papal, director of the Afghan women's football team, recounts the harrowing story of sexual abuse suffered by players and of a sport slow to respond. Fatima Yazbek from the Gulf Institute for Human Rights and Democracy asks why does sport not do more for those suffering human rights abuse in Bahrain? Chair of the United States Olympic Committee Athletes Advisory Council, Han Zhao, questions whether athlete health and safety, as well as the global community, were the first considerations in the eventual postponement of Tokyo 2020. Executive Director of World Players United, Brennan Schwab, reflects on the systemic embedding of sports autonomy in the past five decades, without the underpinning bedrock of human rights to protect athletes, which has led to many tragedies we see today. And Australian para triathlete Katie Kelly, OAM, calls for para sport to move beyond the feel-good factor into economic equality. Dr. Payoshni Mitri calls for a safe playing field, not only a level one for athletes with differences of sex development. And Dr. Sabrina Filsmosa explains the use of sport for peace. These are some of the absorbing articles you'll find in Human Rights Defender, along with contributions from our various themed panellists today. I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Natalie Galea, guest editor of the magazine from the Australian Human Rights Institute. Natalie is a postdoctoral fellow and Australian Olympian, Australian judo team section manager in the 2008 Olympics and currently sits on the International Judo Federation Athletes Commission. Mary Harvey is chief executive at the Centre for Sport and Human Rights, formerly a senior executive at FIFA and world champion with the US women's national soccer team, winning the inaugural FIFA Women's World Cup in 91 and Olympic gold in 96. Mary's article is titled, Why Athlete Rights Should Be at the Core of Sport. Dr. Madeline Pape is a postdoctoral fellow in the Science in Human Culture program and Department of Sociology at Northwestern University, where she debates over the nature of biological sex that arise as part of gender equality projects in sport and biomedicine. Madeline has written on the unlevel global playing field of gender eligibility regulation in sport. Maximilian Klein is the representative for international sports policy and organising at Germany's independent athlete association Athleten Deutschland DB and a Master of Public Policy candidate at Harvard Kennedy School. His article is titled The Human Right of Athletes to Earn a Living. And finally, Dr. Yetza Tuakli is an Associate Research Scientist at the Department of Chronic Disease Epimediology, Yale School of Public Health, a long jumper who represented the Ghana national team until 2016, part of the International Olympic Committee Prevention of Harassment and Abuse Working Group, and founder and director of the Sports Equity Lab in association with Yale, whose article is titled, Superhumans or Sitting Ducks? Welcome to you all, and thank you for being here. Let us begin with guest editor then, uh, Dr. Galea. Natalie, tell us what was your motivation for putting this volume together? Yeah, thank you, Craig, and thank you everybody for joining us today. My co-editor, Ruin Moman, and myself really wanted to uh, release this edition to coincide with the Tokyo Olympic Games and the Tokyo Paralympic Games. Um, and also, in, in particular, Craig, to take the baton from you and to continue to raise the profile of sport and human rights and in particular the rights of athletes. Athletes are humans first and athletes second and I think with um, the with Tokyo being on now next year COVID-19 now really adds different dimensions around athletes rights that still make this edition of the Human Rights Defender magazine very relevant. I just wanted to start as well, Craig, by saying, you know, one of the things that um, is difficult when we talk human rights is we often see it in quite lofty terms. And I guess just to sort of pin down what we mean by it for those who, you know, might not be human rights scholars or come from different parts of our sporting landscape is to say that in terms of 
how we see human rights, the Australian Human Rights Institute, is that we see a do no harm approach within sport. And the other thing I wanted to acknowledge too in relation to um, our magazine is that there are other groups in our society whose human rights are affected by you know, the events of the Olympic Games. And, and those uh, groups, their human rights should not be ignored. But as I said before, you know, athletes do stand at the centre of sport. And I think in the last few years, there's been some really big high-profile incidences where athletes' human rights have really come to the fore. And some of them are really horrific. The US um, Olympic gymnastics team and the systemic sexual abuse of their doctor, Larry Nassar, the sexual abuse of athletes on the Afghanistan women's football team and now the Haitian football team, the discrimination of intersex athletes by um, within the Olympic movement, pay disparity um, between para-athletes and non-para-athletes, but also between, you know, the gender pay um, gap in Olympic-based sports like your very own is football. And in my sport of judo, and as you mentioned, I'm an athlete's representative, you know, we've had recently at the last national, at the last World Championships, we had one of our world champions being threatened by his very own National Olympic Committee um, to withdraw from the event. So, in this edition of the Human Rights Defender magazine, Rowan and myself really wanted to drill down and focus on how athletes were at the intersection of sport and human rights. And you know, athletes themselves aren't, uh, you know of much more than what we just first see on the field. When we really look and examine, athletes are the product that we consume, we go to watch. And in a world where sport is business, athletes are also those very skilled workers employed in, in precarious employment and often unpredictable um, employment. And I, we have to acknowledge here that the, the Olympic movement is a, a sport, it is a sport, sporting movement, but it's also a business enterprise. And if you look from Rio to Sochi, the Olympic movement earned $5.6 billion. And yet athletes within the Olympic movement, their, their work is constrained and subject to autonomous rules that are set out by the IOC and its representative bodies. And some of these rules we'll go into today. Um, for instance, Rule 40, which places restrictions on athletes' ability at the peak of their career to commercialise their name and likeness. And the much debated at the moment, Rule 50, which places restrictions on athletes' freedom of expression. And the thing is, Craig, that despite athletes being the product of a worker, sporting institutions like the IOC have long resisted handing over resources, substantive representation and rights to athletes. Um, so our, our edition of the Human Rights Defender magazine really examines the rules in use within sport and those autonomous rules and how they keep power out of the hands of athletes. The other reason we really were motivated to focus on athletes was that we wanted to give athletes around the globe an independent voice. And we also didn't want to just offer um, offer criticism, but we also wanted to provide the IOC and other sporting bodies with solutions and a way forward. And then finally, and I think this again goes back to Rule 50, um, that's so hotly debated, but we wanted to point out that athletes have always been human rights defenders in the Olympic movement. And they often have done so in peaceful, peaceful and gentle ways. I mean, we all know and remember Tommy Smith, John Carlos, Peter Norman in 1968. Vincent Matthews, Wayne Collette in 72. The amazing moment where Kathy Freeman took the Indigenous and Australian flag and ran around in her victory ceremony in 2000. And then Fiesa Lalisa, Ethiopian, in 2016, who gave a very gentle symbol of resistance. And for his troubles of doing that was exiled from his country. So... We in the magazine really want to pay homage to those human rights defenders and yet again reinforce that athletes are humans first and athletes and athletes second. Thanks, Natalie. And just further to that then, you know, you talk about the trend around the world, which we see of uh, prominent, you know, high profile in particular athletes pushing sport to do more. Mm -hmm. um, are you 
uh, comfortable that athletes are adequately prioritising their own human rights in policy, or is there a risk of just you know, fighting these kind of individual battles rather than ad advocating for broader change? I think that um, there, there needs to be, to your point, a growing movement towards a greater collective action and independent voice of athletes, um, and that, that um, needs to occur moving forward. Um, independent voices, though, are really important, though, in pointing out where the gaps lie in um, athletes' rights abuses, and I, and I don't think you can discount that. Thank you, Natalie. Um, Dr. Tuakli, your research has found that athletes themselves have a very limited understanding of their rights. Tell us why this research is so vital and please expand on your findings thus far. Oh, sure, I would love to. And thank you so much for including me in this great, uh, great discussion and, and webinar. Natalie happens to be part of the research group, so it's really an honor to share our work. So for context, I'll first describe the study and then share preliminary results. The aim was to number one, examine the knowledge, and number two, examine the attitudes and beliefs that athletes have about their human rights as expressed in the 2017 and 2018 declarations of athletes' rights. Okay, we know that these documents don't incorporate the full slate of entitlements delineated in the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, but these policies were chosen because they are sport specific. In designing and validating the survey, we separated factual knowledge from core attitudes and beliefs because we know there's a meaningful distinction between these two constructs. I can know, for example, that yes, I should exercise for at least 30 minutes at a moderate intensity most days per week to be healthy, but it's my attitudes and beliefs, sometimes bad attitudes and beliefs, that drive my actual behavior. And in this case, might lead me to be sedentary. So, we wanted to see if there was any discordance between knowledge and beliefs. So we explored each of these constructs totally separately. Here's what we found. To date, 1,092 para and non-disabled athletes from 45 countries representing 37 sports have participated in our survey. 60% are currently competing internationally, 55% self-identify as women, and 20% are Paralympic athletes. So that's the description of the cohort. Anywhere between 91 and 93% have technical knowledge that yes, equality of opportunity, freedom of expression, and privacy are the right of every athlete when they are acting in the realm of their sport. Interestingly, a full 15%, however, do not know that effective remedy when rights are violated and control over the commercial use of their image is also their right. When we looked at the beliefs construct, things got a little more interesting. Okay, a full 26% do not feel that they can freely seek redress for harms, and almost 40% do not feel that they can freely express their personal opinion in sport, despite the fact that that same group did say that freedom of expression is an athlete's right. So you see there's a disconnect between knowledge and beliefs. The final question asks if athletes are aware of these athletes' rights declaration. A full 83% said that no, they are unaware that these documents even exist. So in summary, whilst the majority have technical knowledge of most of the fundamental core human rights afforded to them, a shockingly high percentage have attitudes and beliefs that run contrary to that knowledge. And this discordance is concerning because we know that as humans, it's our beliefs that often drive our behavior. Just like knowing I should exercise isn't enough. If I don't feel like it, I won't. And so I cannot reap the benefits of that knowledge. For athletes, knowing they have freedom of expression, for example, isn't enough. They don't truly feel free to express their ideas and opinions in the context of their sport. And so they won't. Thus, they will be functionally censored and silenced and ironically, the one place on the planet where their participation, mind, body, and spirit, is not just needed, it's actually the most needed above everyone else in sport. Their participation is the central and only indispensable ingredient. Athletes are the sport. I'm just going to leave it right there. Those are the early results. Data collection is still ongoing. Survey is still open. Thanks. Thank you, Yetza. Could you just elaborate then, please, on 
the varied understanding of rights as well. You say prioritisation of rights seems inconsistent and potentially gendered. You talk about self-identified male respondents more cognizant of certain rights and female others. Could you expand on that, please? Very happy to, Craig. So self-identified male respondents seemed highly cognizant of rights that had to do with financial considerations. So pay equity, appropriate levels of pay, and the commercial use of their image. Whereas self-identified female respondents really sort of associated the term human rights or athletes' rights in sport with other considerations, really mostly to do with their physical bodies and overall personal agency and safety. So in that way, there was a varied understanding of what the term human rights in sport meant to the athlete. And I think, you know, we'll get into why I, I think some of the qualitative findings associated with these varied understandings become even more important, adding meat to the bones. Um, but just in terms of this high-level survey, um, we did see this differences in understandings between men and women, between para and non-disabled athletes, and between Global South and Global North athletes, also between union-affiliated and non-union-affiliated athletes. But again, data collection is ongoing, so I really hesitate as a scientist to say anything definitive today. This is just sort of the preliminary high-level results. Wonderful. We appreciate that. Uh, Mary, if, uh, you know, if athletes still today um, evidently have a limited understanding of their rights, you're arguing that, nevertheless, athlete rights need to be at the very centre, at the core of sport. Can you expand on that for us, please? Sure. Thanks, Craig, and happy to be here. Thanks for having me uh, with the group today. Um, I mean, it's been said already, athletes are sport. We don't have sport without athletes. And what I think, um, I'm just building off what's been said, um, the one thing that I think a lot of people don't realize when they see particularly Olympic athletes or World Cup athletes, uh, they think of them as in invincible. And actually, um, they're incredibly vulnerable. And the power differential that athletes uh, have or endure is substantial. Um, they are often working with people around them who hold a tremendous amount of power over their success um, or are gatekeepers to it. And so that leads to, when you have big disparities in power differential, that's where human rights um, vulnerabilities occur. So, you know, athletes, it's, again, it's, it's been said, they're human beings first um, and uh, athletes second, and they have rights. So freedom of expression, the right to be protected against discrimination, the right to have decent working conditions, so on and so forth, um, and they're they're incredibly vulnerable, and we're seeing un really unfortunate cases of abuse, and it's been mentioned already, the physical abuse, sexual abuse, physical abuse, um, emotional abuse. Um, we have, you know, so, some athletes that haven't been named yet, uh, Mary Kane, so runner, um, the uh, gymnasts in various countries around the world are speaking out. I mean, things like being denied, you can't have a bar of soap, right? I mean, this is crazy stuff. Um, power sort of differential leads to all of this crazy behavior in the name of pursuit of high performance. Um, you have the um, South Korean triathlete, Choi suk Hyun, it's important to remember her name, who recently committed suicide. So, uh, and then you have, you know, football players um, who are enduring racial abuse on the pitch. So by fans. Um, none of this is okay, um, and these are basic human rights that, that need to be put in the center of a discussion around human rights in sport, because athletes are at the center of it. Um, the other one's freedom of expression, um, and freedom of expression um, is being talked about quite a bit right now for, for a couple of reasons, um, and we'll maybe get to this later, but COVID has certainly prompted, um, you know, athletes to speak out because there's fear about health and safety, uh, you know, as they're being asked to go back and play. Um, but also, um, you know, the, the Black Lives Matter movement and, um, and other uh, forms of advocacy that athletes are now bringing into their workplace. So, but I think the core thing is, is, you know, a lot of times um, decisions are made about athletes without their involvement without their engagement, certainly without their consent, but also just without engaging them. So, you know, if you're a mining company and you're going to dig up a community, you know, you don't just do that without talking to them and saying, you know, 
how are we going to mitigate different risks and the impact to a community? But when it comes to athlete rights, often there are changes, policies that are made, and athletes aren't consulted. Um, they're not part of the, the stakeholder engagement um, by the people who are affected. So it's the idea of, you know, you can't make a decision about me without me. Um, and that's really sort of the core of why uh, athletes are the center um, and athlete rights are the center uh, and core to sport. And so Natalie mentioned earlier, as many people are right now, you know, these uh, social causes around the world, social justice, racial equality, Black Lives Matter, where athletes, particularly in the US, are becoming really deeply and actively involved. And for many of us in sport, we see that uh, this as a trend that we'd certainly like to see continue. But what you say in your article is, is right, and that is that sport often sees the athlete voice as political, in inverted commas. But is it, and ultimately, who makes that decision? That's a great question. I mean, there's freedom of expression. We just held a webinar and picking in freedom of expression as a basic human right and an enabling human right, we picked it apart. Um, I mean, and it gets into sort of, you know, at what point um, would you limit freedom of expression for reasons that may be given? Um, and, there, and there could be good reasons for that. It could be health and public health and safety. You know, if an athlete were to do something or say something that was inflammatory and it shows up on a jumbotron in front of 80,000 people, there could be a public safety risk. Um, but in other cases, um, you know, athlete um, voice um, is, is something that, uh, you know, is limited perhaps without those legitimate reasons uh, why you might limit freedom of expression. So, you know, that's very concerning. Um, and I think, again, that a lot of this could be um, unpacked, as it were, um, with stakeholder engagement with the athletes themselves. Dr. Pope, can I come to you, please? Uh, in your piece on female athlete eligibility regulation, you referred to the unlevel global playing field in women's sport. Can you tell us what you mean by that, please? Yeah, sure. So thanks for your question, Craig. Um, the, the piece that I contributed focuses on the regulation of female athlete eligibility or more specifically uh, regulations that apply to women who have naturally high uh, testosterone levels. Um, I won't describe the details of these regulations in, in depth, though I would be more than happy to elaborate later on. Um, but I think the best way for me to answer your question, Craig, um, about what I mean by the unlevel global playing field in women's sport is to uh, call attention to the experiences of women who've been affected uh, by the regulations. Now, one of those women is Annette Nageza, uh, a Ugandan 800 metre runner, who actually contributed her story uh, to this issue of the human rights defender. Uh, so my contribution to this magazine is actually a piece that accompanies and frames Annette's story about how her life has been um, impacted uh, by the regulation of female athlete eligibility. Now, Annette's, Annette's story is a very distressing one. Um, it's a story of a promising, talented, uh, dedicated, very passionate athlete uh, being advised by medical officials located in Europe uh, with ties to World Athletics, which is the peak governing body for track and field, uh, to undergo irreversible surgeries to stop her body from producing testosterone, um, even though there was the option of, of medication that would have been adequate for that purpose. Um, there was no follow-up for Annette post-surgery, um, as there should have been, uh, and the health consequences for her have been very serious uh, because testosterone does so much in, in the body beyond what we associate with athletic performance. I mean, testosterone is critical to the healthy function of our body. And now Annette has to live with the consequences of that uh, throughout her life. Um, Annette's story is not an isolated one. We know that the majority of women who've been impacted by these eligibility regulations, uh, at least in recent years, uh, all women of colour from global, global South nations or um, by far and away, far and away the majority are women of colour from global South nations. So why does this happen? Uh, and it happens because of what I call the unlevel global playing field. I mean, as a starting point, we know that the regulations favour 
uh, the uh, countries where the medical response to women who have high testosterone uh, is to intervene early. Um, things like uh, surgeries performed on infants and young children, which I would might add um, have been resisted by intersex communities in these countries for a long time. Um, so there's a regional bias uh, that's built into the regulations that privileges global north ways of doing things uh, and which means that it's women from certain parts of the world uh, that are going to be most impacted by these regulations from the outset. And on top of that, we're seeing widespread cultural acceptance within sports like my own, um, track and field, of this kind of scrutiny um, of women of colour from global South nations. You know, it's too easily being accepted as normal when it's far from normal, far from ethical. Um, and various researchers have shown that uh, this acceptance of not just the scrutiny of these women, but acceptance of the harm that's being inflicted, inflicted on their bodies uh, comes about because of how our ideologies of race and nation are shaping the ways that we're thinking about um, and perceiving femininity uh, in the context of sport. So thank you, Madeline. Can you just explain this passage, please, where you talk about women's equals human rights? and you're talking about feminist activists in the 80s. You say in your research you've heard elite athletes questioning whether women's rights are today being compromised in the name of human rights, as athletes like Casta Semenya pursue the ability to compete in women's sport free of medical intervention. Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad you highlighted that passage, Craig. Um, I, I frequently uh, heard in my, in my research where I... Um, was speaking with people involved at the elite level of track and field um, across various countries. Uh, I frequently heard that it's kind of like women's rights are being compromised in the name of human rights, uh, or that you know the rights of normatively bodied women are somehow uh, being uh, pitted against the rights of women with high testosterone. You know, like it's a zero sum game here. Uh, and I think that's a false and misleading uh, framing. I think, um, you know, for, for starters, um, women's sport has has a lot to lose here, actually, uh, from the way that this issue is unfolding. Um, I mentioned the the global dynamics of this. Well, I have heard from, from people located uh, in sub-Saharan Africa in particular and people involved in grassroots sports that women... Uh, young women and, and girls are turning away from the sport of track and field. Uh, they are afraid to uh, do well uh, and and end up being subjected to the same scrutiny that uh, many um, high-profile athletes from that region um, have been subjected to. You know, athletes like Casta Semenya. So they're they're turning away from from our sport, and and that's a major loss for uh, women's sport. And this is, I think, recognised by a number of major women's sports organisations, um, organisations like the Women's Sports Foundation, also the International Working Group for Women in Sport. Uh, they recognise that um, women's sport has, uh, has a lot to gain by working towards uh, including women with high testosterone and trying to uh, work towards challenging uh, some of the assumptions um, that are uh, shaping the way that people are perceiving this issue. Thank you, Madeline. Let's move on now to hear more about two of the rules that Natalie mentioned before from the Olympic movement, the IOC, known uh, famously and perhaps infamously as Rule 40 and Rule 50, much talked about in recent times. First to another magazine contributor, Stannis Ellsberg from Play the Game, who couldn't be with us today but wanted to participate through a, a digital message. The author of the article Fist of Freedom or a Fist of Iron, Rule 50 and the Olympic Paradox in this new issue of the Human Rights Defender. I'm very happy to be a part of this new special edition of the Human Rights Defender, which addresses what I think is one of the most important issues in today's sports, namely the human rights of athletes. I would like to say thank you to all the people behind the magazine and a special thank you to Natalie who thought of me for this uh, issue of the Human Rights Defender. My article addresses what I think is the International Olympic Committee's biggest issues these days, namely the Rule 50, 
my main point of my article is that the Rule 50 only seems to apply for athletes and not for the host nations who pay to arrange the spectacle. They can, for an example, use the opening ceremony for their cultural propaganda, while athletes who raise their fist or kneel at the medal ceremony will get expelled from the Olympics, as we saw in 1968. The paradox is that if you have a set of rules, they have to apply to all. So Rule 50 has to apply to both the host nation or the athletes. Or simply, we don't need the Rule 50. At the time you are watching this, I am probably sleeping as I am living in Denmark, where I work for the initiative Play the Game as an analyst and head of conference for our international conference. I hope you will have a great seminar with some great discussions on this very, very important issues. Thank you once again for allowing me to contribute to this issue of the Human Rights Defender. Thank you to the Australian Human Rights Institute. Thank you to Natalie and Gabrielle and the whole team behind the magazine. Thank you and have a nice seminar. See you. Thank you, Stannis. Uh, Mary, can I come to you on that? Because you mentioned earlier about freedom of expression. You know, this is, uh, Rule 50 really goes to the heart of that. We see so many professional athletes around the world now being so vocal. You know, and the WNBA is doing a fabulous job. They, in fact, the rest of their season have dedicated to what they call social justice issues. Um, the Olympic movement, however, and Thomas Bach's recent comments uh, are still problematic in this regard. What's your views on it? Well, thanks, Greg, for the question. Um, you know, you can unpack uh, freedom of expression into its pieces, but we're also looking at through the lens of sport. And so, you know, I, I mentioned before public health and safety. Um, there can be certain instances, hate speech, um, where where it would be um, permissible to limit freedom of expression. And this is according to the people at Article 19 and others who who really follow um, and protect the right of, of expression, freedom of expression. Um, but there's also the sporting piece of it. And all of us here have a have a connection to sport as, as athletes. And there's a, you know, beyond that, there's a perhaps a concept of fair play that we all learn respect for opponents, things like this. So you, know, you start to go from the legal side of freedom of expression and, and into the ethical side. So you're, you're sort of moving into this other area of, is it okay to disparage another athlete on the podium with you? You know, you know and, all, and some of us you know, can, can you know, understand where that would be just not okay. Um, so it, it gets tricky. Uh, and we, we looked at, in particular, um, FIFA, you know, when they uh, have to understand how to determine which flags they allow into stadiums at a World Cup, right? So social causes versus political. And how do you differentiate between the two? So, you know, the stadium ban for women in Iran, you know, it's, it's allowing those banners in if they are phrased in a certain way where it's advocating for a social cause as opposed to something that's very clearly political. And so there is work to unpack that. Um, and again, I feel that stakeholder engagement with athletes to say, okay, is there an opportunity to to collectively agree that you know the sporting principles of fair play that we don't do certain things we don't disparage others right but broader social causes if done in the right way would be permissible but again i, I feel that athletes um really should be core to any discussion about what they can and can't do thanks mary let's go to maximilian then and talk about rule 40 uh, equally as contentious, uh, you write a piece where you're referencing human rights, Maximilian, around rights particularly to labour, which are enshrined in various legal frameworks, including the UDHR and, and the ILO's Equal Remuneration Convention. So what specifically did the German Athletes Commission challenge in relation to Rule 40 and why? Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, I think when we're talking about Rule 40 and the Olympic Charter, um, we are especially talking about the economic well-being of athletes, and I think it's it's fair to say uh, 
that across the world uh, athletes struggle financially. So I have some data on Germany. Uh, I, data is rare on average across the world, but uh, for Germany, for example, they earn like seven seven euro forty per hour, which is below the minimum wage. They have opportunity costs when when they're pursuing their sports career and missing out on education, on pension schemes and stuff like that. So on average, they have like an opportunity cost of several ten thousands uh, of euros, uh, and they're not making too much money. On the other hand, and that's the issue here. Um, the Olympic movement and the RC has become like a multi-billion uh, corporation making 1.4 billion uh, US dollars per year. And the Olympic Charter basically protects these Olympic properties at the expense of athletes' rights. That's the issue here. Because the report he heavily limits uh, the possibilities and opportunities for athletes to commercially exploit their image actually to, own, uh, to, to earn the fruits of their own labor. And this is what we challenged. We said, okay, this is against competition law because um, basically Rule 40 is in breach of current German competition law and we also think European competition law. And the, the rule itself is basically uh, excluding the athletes at the very peak of their career. That's, that's the issue uh, from having uh, from earning money from um, going to these advertising markets uh, during the Olympics. They don't really get a fair share for the hard work and dedication of, over several years. Um, we filed this complaint and it's, it's important to say that the industry themselves, they filed a complaint too. So it was the athletes and the industries, the sporting goods industry, that filed a complaint at our German uh, federal cartel office, the FCO. And they actually said that the Rule 40 is in breach of competition law. And this is what we challenged. We thought this is unfair and this is against uh, current law. Uh, it violates uh, from a human rights perspective, um, because we were using competition law, but from a human rights perspective, we, we could argue it violates uh, everyone, everyone's rights to earn a living and to enjoy the fruits of their own labor. Um, I would argue Olympic athletes perform work for the Olympic movement and that the Olympic Charter here uh, violates the human rights to earn a living. And what is important to say, and I think when we're discussing Rule 50, it's the same issue. Also, nation states have a responsibility here because these breaches uh, are not their jurisdiction too. So for the future, what happened is uh, the IOC said, okay, each and every one after, after uh, the, the cartel office said, okay, uh, we have to find a new Rule 40, we have to amend it. Each and every state tried to amend their own Rule 40. So what we're having now is a legal hodgepodge across the world. It's a very difficult situation. Just for Europe, for example, a German-speaking athlete is, to, is allowed to do more advertising during the Olympic Games than Austrian athletes. And that's a problem because now we're talking about discrimination just for the German market. So we are wishing for, like, for competition law that we're taking this to a European level. The European Commission is, or, is already looking into the issue, and we want to have a, a fair and level playing field across the world for all the athletes. Therefore, we need benchmarks, and these benchmarks need to protect the athletes' rights and not necessarily uh, the Olympic Charter properties. Thanks, Max. And of course, when the uh, uh, magazine's coming out very shortly, people will know that uh, they'll be able to read responses also from I both IOC and FIFA to some of the articles in the magazine, which really rounds out, you know, both sides of this contentious argument. Let me just go to you now on that, Then you, of course, on the Judo Athletes Commission. Mm -hmm. So you know these athletes commissions really well over a number of years as, as a former Olympian, of course. Did you want to reflect just briefly on Rule 40 and 50, what your views are, and, and further to that, how the IOC, in your view, can become a role model for human rights? Yeah, look, Craig, I think from my experience of being an Athletes Commission um, member for the Judo, International Judo Federation and for attending some of these um, IOC Athletes Commission Forum, a few things really, um, I guess, resonate for me, particularly around consultation of athletes. Um, I think that the consultation, as, even, as we're seeing now with Rule 50, is that we were told actually they that the IOC had already consulted with athletes, but quite clearly they hadn't consulted comprehensively enough because they're redoing that consultation again now. And I think it's sort of, from my um, experience, it really highlights the fact that it's really hard to see 
um, who's communicating to athletes? Is it a message from the IOC or is it a message from an independent athletes commission? And I think that increasingly the message from the athletes commission um, has been constrained um, at an Olympic level. The other thing I would say is that in recent years, we've seen the emergence of, um, in response to a lot of these rules and, and athletes um, speaking up about their athlete, their human rights, that we've seen the emergence of an athlete's rights and responsibility declaration that was developed by a group of the Athletes Commission um, members. And, you know, critics of that um, declaration say that it does not go far enough, in fact, that it doesn't recognise um, athletes' rights. And in, in many cases, it actually still puts the, the rights of athletes under the rules of um, the Olympic movement and sporting institutions. And those rules, you know, as we've heard from um, Max, but also Stannis, you know, breach athletes' rights and minimise their rights. And I guess the thing that, for me, um, and I asked this question at the last Athletes Commission Forum, was, you know, where is the mechanism to address um, grievances if athletes have them, if their human rights are breached? Um, and so I think that these, these, this declaration really hasn't done much to shift power into the hands of athletes. The other thing I would say is that the Olympic movement has, um, you know, sought counsel from you know, the former UN High Commissioner of Human Rights, um, and they are considering um, his recommendations currently. Um, and I guess our magazine really um, encourages the IOC to commit to a do-no-harm human rights approach to protecting athletes and the groups that the Olympic movement come into contact with. I, we know that the Olympic movement can change its rules. It's recently done it in terms of the age of IOC members. So we know that it can go about and change and really adopt, you know, a human rights approach to its Olympic charter. Um, and I think in that approach, in that Olympic charter, really central to it is the respect of human rights and the protection of human rights, but also the remedy when rights are breached. Um, and Craig, you know, to your point earlier in the question, the IOC has an enormous reach. Every two years, you know, the globe turns on and watches, you know, the spectacular of the Olympic movement. And increasingly, there are other smaller events, Youth Olympics, etc. So I think really the IOC has to move with the times and start to recognise that, you know, it has a duty of care to athletes and to the people um, who the Olympic movement affects. So, yeah, that's where I see the the IOC role modelling as being a better human rights citizen globally. Thanks, Natalie. So if uh, rights and recognising those rights are one thing, remedy is quite another, as you've said there. Mary, how do we give the victims of human rights abuse in sport access to effective remedy? And thanks, Craig. So let's start with looking at what we mean by remedy. Um, when I first started to do work, um, for, you know, from being a sports administrator, to, to working in human rights, I didn't understand a lot of these terms. Um, so remedy, you know, fundamentally means righting a harm that's been done. When a human rights um, of someone has been breached, uh, how do you make it right? Um, and sometimes that can be an apology. It can be preventing this from happening to other people. It can be restitution, putting them back to where they were before, you know, the, their human rights were, were violated. Or, or it can be financial compensation. I mean, there are a variety of different ways that you can offer remedy. Um, and it applies in all contexts. This is the hardest part um, of human rights work is remedy. You know, we talk a lot about prevention and mitigation, um, but remedy is the tough part, right? And this is where people get uncomfortable. Um, but, you know, if human rights harms occur in sport, such as an athlete's abused or discriminated against, or they're asked to have a medical intervention in order to continue to compete that's endangering their health and safety, um, there need to be you know, two things. One, there needs to be a safe way to report it. So you can't report it to the people who are in power of some of these things that are happening to you. Um, and also, there needs to be a meaningful way to address um, the harm that's been done to you. So it needs to be fit for purpose. So the problem is, is that many of the complaints in dispute, you know, the, the grievance mechanism, so the way to give complaints and the way to resolve um, what's happened, um, 
that athletes use or required to use are designed um, to protect the integrity of sport and the sporting institutions, uh, not the people whose rights have been impacted. And there, there are a variety of, of ways, you know, examples of this. Um, so, for example, many of um, the complaint reporting mechanisms may involve things like contracts, um, doping, corruption. Uh, but what if it's, you know, you're an athlete and you've just been sexually assaulted by the president of your sport, governing body in your country? What do you do? Who do you call? Who do you complain to? Right? Um, is there a safe way to report that? I mean, it's traumatic what's happened. Physical assault. You know, we see, um, you know, in the case of, of um, you know, the, the triathlete in, uh, in South Korea, she reported to several different bodies what was happening to her, you know, from uh, her National Olympic Committee to a variety of others, and she was so desperate she ended up taking her own life. So, I mean, what's important is, is that, you know, that, that these grievance mechanisms or the ways that that is handled. So how do you make this right? Needs to be fit for purpose. And right now it's set up for very different things. And that's the gap. Thanks, Mary. There's certainly a lot of work to do there. Uh, can I just come to you and we're, we're coming to um, the end after what's been a really uh, absorbing discussion to, to Madeline, uh, Dr. Pike, what can we do to make sure that we do give athletes a voice, which has been a very common theme today? Right. And I, I, I mean, in the context of um, the issue I'm focused on, it's, a, it's actually a really interesting question because uh, I often um, encounter from uh, the women I termed normatively bodied women athletes, the women athletes who aren't being scrutinized, um, I often um, encounter that they feel that they are not able to speak out to uh, share their reasons for wanting there to be regulation of women with high testosterone. You know, they're fearful that of there being a public backlash um, if they were to voice their point of view. So they feel silenced. Um, and this is where it gets tricky because on the one hand, those women do have the right to speak, but on the other hand, they're already very privileged and there is the potential to inflict great harm um, on the lives of the women that they're talking about. Um, and certainly uh, many of the women who've been impacted by uh, regulations in this instance um, have found themselves isolated, certainly no voice, uh, no choices, um, with their lives turned upside down uh, by these regimes. Um, but as I said before, I think it's false in this instance to pitch the rights of uh, women or women's rights against human rights. Um, and I think there's a huge role here to be played by uh, sports governing bodies um, to work towards uh, fostering dialogue and exchange and understanding and empathy rather than trying to fuel uh, what we currently see, which is a very polarised, uh, very fear-driven uh, discussion um, about this topic, which uh, often isn't um, enabling all of the complexities of this issue uh, to come to the fore and be grappled with, um, and, and certainly not um, enabling the, the lived experiences of the women who are impacted by these rules uh, to be uh, heard about uh, and learn from. Um, so I think that sports governing bodies have a, a big role to play in terms of providing forums where this uh, kind of um, exchange can, can take place. Thank you, Madeline. And, and finally, to Yetza, uh, you know, your research findings are, are yet to come. Do you have any uh, particular views on, you know, the edu ongoing education of athletes then? How do we ensure that athletes around the world at a young age and, and following th flowing through to the professional or Olympic level, that they have a, a really sound understanding and therefore are able to advocate for and assert their rights. Absolutely, uh, Craig, just piggybacking off what Madeline said, I'm an African woman and so I grew up around a dinner table that was full of story. And I think from a research standpoint, we in sports research really tend to lean away from some of the qualitative story-based data that really would, when shared intergenerationally, intergenerationally, would really give athletes a platform to share 
and generate at some leadership when it comes to understanding rights in the sports context. So one of the most unexpected joys of the project really was the rich qualitative data set that came out of the free text responses and the in-depth interviews. Athletes were so excited to participate as well as share their opinions about what rights language really meant to them. So I think in sports research, again, just bring it sort of to what we can do in the lane that we're in, what needs to change is the bias against and deprioritization of qualitative research methodology. So that's structured interviews, which seek to understand the human elements of something. And these methods are very often abandoned in favor of qual quantitative methods, like objective multiple choice questionnaires, which really don't tell the full story. So with this issue, we need to hear athletes voices in their own words, at their own paces, in their own environments, and qualitative research is the vehicle to access these stories. I think in this way we can uncover athlete-centered but also athlete-generated understandings of the human rights of athletes that need to be respected all, at all times and all settings in sport. I mean, these data sets to me are not only valid, but they're also vital. Um, and I do feel that, as Mary said, this is a very complex and layered issue. We have not, nobody has yet taken the full corpus of human rights declarations that are internationally recognized and line them up against the broad tenets of sport that we all know and love. So until that's done with athletes at the table, governing bodies at the table, again, with everyone sharing their stories and perspectives, I don't think we'll really move forward. So I, again, it's, it comes back to really what we've talked about this entire time, the importance of voice, you know, inviting voice in a trauma-informed, sensitive way, but really looking at it as valid and vital if we're gonna move this conversation forward. And Mary, of course, the center sits, as you uh, point out in your article, in this uh, space between uh, global sporting bodies and institutions and civil society. So, you know, what's your view then on this, on the future, how it looks for professional athletes better understanding their rights? Is there an education piece there? Is that is that starting to happen? Are you seeing, uh, for instance, athlete representative organizations start to organize this type of education or how do you see that happening? Well, it, yes, we're starting to see, particularly around athlete activism, uh, we are seeing um, various organizations, including governing bodies, talking about athlete activism. Um, but I'm gonna go back again to the critical importance of the stakeholder engagement piece of this. Um, to really understand a problem, you need to talk to the people who are affected by it. And when you do that, you learn a tremendous amount. You learn things that you wouldn't learn otherwise. Um, I mean, sports bodies are not experts in everything. So, you know, when I did work around, you know, how to embed human rights into, you know, something like the World Cup, um, I didn't know what a lot of these um, possible human rights risks would look like. But I did understand it when I started to talk to civil society. So sport has an enormous opportunity to engage civil society around what these risks are, because that informs then the way to prevent and mitigate it, right? That informs policy. Um, but without that engagement, you're really flying blind. You don't know what you're trying to protect against, and that includes abuse of athletes. Thank you, Mary. Well. And to, to you all for uh, your contributions. We just have a few minutes near the end here to uh, reflect on some of the questions from the audience and people have been sending in over the last couple of days. It might go to the first one is actually from Australia's Sex Discrimination Commissioner at the Australian Human Rights Commission, Kate Jenkins. Kate asks, COVID-19 has a significant impact on sport at both elite and grassroots level. Will this have an impact on the power and influence of athletes to influence their sports when they will now be competing for even fewer resources in support of their Olympic dream? What should sports do to ensure COVID-19 doesn't slow the momentum towards human rights and sport? To any panelists. I'd be happy to chime in and give my sociological perspective. I mean, so my uh, primary area of interest is gender and sport um, and so when I hear this question from Kate Jenkins I, my mind goes immediately to the gender dynamics uh, of what we're seeing currently in the COVID moment um, and women's sport. Um, I know in the UK right now there is no women's 
professional sport happening and uh, across a number of countries uh, we're seeing um, questions uh, being asked about the, the, the potential to maintain uh, women's some some of these like budding women's professional leagues um, and I, I wrote about this with a colleague of mine at Victoria University uh, Fiona McLaughlin and we we pointed out how there is this interesting way in which women's sport has over time been constructed as needing handouts, uh, always dependent on the goodwill of governing bodies to, to provide the funding that's needed, whereas somehow men's sport just seems to be able to fund itself. And that's not how it works. We prop up men's sport as much as we prop up women's sport. And we're actually seeing that now uh, in the COVID moment, the amount of support that's needed from uh, various sources to ensure that men's professional sport survives. So I think there is uh, a really critical moment here uh, to take stock of these different factors that shape uh, the success of various leagues and to recognise the gender biases that often underpin our thinking uh, in relation to professional sport uh, to ensure that we're giving women's sport uh, as much, if not greater, chance to to keep making uh, great strides, um, at, and especially build on some of the the really good progress we've seen in recent years, which is at risk of, of stalling, certainly. Uh, Craig, I would say that that uh, you know we just did this at the uh, in in UK Parliament, um, the all party parliamentary group, where we talked about uh, this exact thing, and in cases where sport is being bailed out with government funding there should absolutely be protections for women's sports and sports for persons with disabilities i mean they those need to be protected if you're using public money to save men's elite sport then we need to look at all sport because we know that um that there are inequalities when it comes to pure economics And to bring our a webinar to a close then, we've just got a couple of minutes left, guys. I might go firstly to guest editor Natalie. And Mary, you might also want to comment on this given that you know, you're the Chief Executive of the Centre for Sport and Human Rights. We've talked a lot today, rightly, about the crises coming out, you know, the tragedies that we've seen with African women's team and gymnasts and others right around the world. So perhaps it would be good to finish on a positive note um, by guiding us to a sport or an organisation within the global framework that does human rights well. Natalie, you know, where can we look to for inspiration? Where can we say that you know, the trend is positive and, uh, and sport is going to recognise human rights adequately in future? Yeah, thanks, Craig. Look, I think that um, there are a number of sports, your own sport of football, which have adopted a human rights policy. But I guess probably at one end of the continuum really is the Commonwealth Games um, time, Mary. I know that you have you worked with them. Um, found a federation that really has um, led with human rights and they're not um, afraid. And in fact, it's, it's their... It's, They've shifted their whole um, legacy to, I guess, an event that was sort of seeing its dying days to now being an event or a sporting event of the future. Um, did you want to add a bit more? Because I know you work with the um, Commonwealth Games, Mary. Yeah, I mean, look at when Black Lives Matter happened, right? And you started to see athletes protesting. What was the first thing David Grevenberg said? He's the CEO of Commonwealth Sport. He said, any athlete that wants to peacefully protest in, in, you know, to protect Black Lives Matter is welcome to do so in Birmingham 2022. Bam. I mean, just went right out front. And he said, we're comfortable having uncomfortable conversations. And, I mean, he, he's the CEO of a movement that is based in, <laughs> comes from colonialism, right? And so he talks about to get to truth and reconciliation, you have to first start with truth. And so they're not shying away from truth and truth, you know, when it comes to athlete demonstration. I mean, now he was true to message. He's on message. He said, you know what? This is fine here. So, I mean, I think there's it's it's I mean, human rights commitments and policies are, are important and critical, but also leadership of just saying when things happen in the world, you know, reminding us of why this matters.
Thanks, Mary. And truth at the moment, and we would say probably historically, comes from the athletes, and that's growing in frequency around the world every day, and institutional sport is going to need to reconcile with that. So I'll remind everyone that the magazine is coming very soon. Natalie, can't, can't wait for it. Everyone who registered uh, today for this webinar will receive it by email shortly, and we look forward to more contributions in this area so that we can all one day say that athlete rights are indeed at the very heart of the practice and the business of sport. Thanks to all my esteemed panellists, to everyone watching, and to all, be safe.